Good evening and welcome to everyone. It is just a few moments after 7 p.m. here on the West Coast, and we're grateful to be able to join together once again for our Bible study. I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to join with us on tonight, and I pray that you are being blessed through our time together. It is certainly a rewarding time for me, and I pray that God is providing for you something to help you in your walk uh, and in your journey. As we're beginning our lesson tonight, uh, again, I want to uh, welcome those who are on our conference line, as well as those who are joining us on Facebook Live on tonight. Uh, we're going to continue tonight with our Bible study on the seven churches, the seven churches that are found in the book of Revelation. Tonight, we're going to be looking at the fourth church that is referenced uh, in uh, the book of Revelation. Uh, and we're going to get there in just a moment. But before we do, as we do every uh, Wednesday night, I do want to uh, provide you with a brief devotionals, just something for you to consider as we're beginning our lesson tonight. Tonight, we're going to be looking at a scripture that is a reminder that we must prepare ourselves. We must be prepared uh, ahead of time for God's blessings. You see, we're constantly praying that God would do things for us, that God would answer our needs, and that God would provide a way, but we have to prepare ahead of time. We have to act like what we believe, even when we have not yet received it. We have to act like what we believe, even though we have not received it. This is what faith is all about. Faith is about action ahead of time. It's about going where you've never gone and believing that it can happen even though you don't see it yet. So let's give you a scripture to help to encourage each one of you tonight to act like what you believe ahead of time. Look with me, if you would, at 2 Kings chapter number 4. 2 Kings chapter number 4, and we're going to read just the seven verses beginning at verse number 1 from the King James Version. Turn with me, if you would, to 2 Kings chapter number 4. And tonight we're going to begin at verse number one and read through verse number seven. And the word of God declares, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elijah, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be slaves. And Elijah said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house except a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow the vessels from all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee, and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him, and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stopped flowing. The oil stopped flowing. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, pay thy debt, and live, thou and thy children on the rest. My brothers and sisters, this is a scripture that simply says that you have to prepare ahead of time for God's breakthrough. You have to act like what you believe, even though you have not yet achieved it. You have to walk in faith, even though you have not yet seen it. When this woman was faced with a overwhelming challenge, she went to the man of God who gave her instructions. The instructions were simply this, get ready. Get ready ahead of time. Prepare yourself for an overflow. Prepare yourself for a breakthrough. Prepare yourself for your healing. Prepare yourself for your deliverance. Prepare yourself for an answer and believe it. 
Get as many vessels as you can, empty vessels. And once you've set yourself aside into a space that is consecrated, set aside, you and your sons, I want you to see what God is going to do. Now the scripture says that as long as she had vessels to pour in, the oil kept flowing. She prepared. Elijah had told her, don't get a few, get many, because God has something in store for you. You see, the bigger you are in your belief, the bigger God is in his deliverance. If you believe it, God will do it. When the man brought his son who was sick to the Lord, and the Lord, uh, he asked the Lord Jesus to heal him, the Lord said, do you believe? He said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. My belief is small, but I know you're big. So the word of God tonight for all of us is simply this. Prepare yourself, <coughs> excuse me, ahead of time. Act like what you believe. Walk in it. Have faith, even though you haven't seen it yet. God will always deliver. Praise God for the word tonight. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for tonight's word. And as we prepare ourselves to study these seven churches, the seven churches that you instructed John to write to, I pray, Lord, that you will help us to see ourselves in this, that we can learn from this, that we need not make the same errors as those in the past, but we will understand what your requirements are, what you expect of us, that we will be able to see the adversary even in advance. But Lord, I'm praying tonight that those who have joined us tonight will prepare themselves for what you have in store. There is an infinite supply of oil. All that is needed is a willing vessel. There's an infinite supply of anointing. All is needed is a willing vessel. There's an infinite supply of gifts. All that is needed is a willing vessel. So Lord, I pray tonight that we, like this woman, will be the willing vessel and that you will pour into us everything that you have to give to us that we might be able to live and not die. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you all. Let's jump into our lesson tonight. I want you to go with me now to a Revelation, Revelation chapter number two, as we are continuing to wrap up our study. Tonight, we're going to move into the fourth letter, and we've shared with you on several occasions as we've opened up these letters, uh, these words to you that John, who wrote this, John was simply transcribing the words of Jesus as Jesus revealed them to him. These were letters that were sent to churches that actually were in existence at the time that John crafted these letters. John was on the island of Patmos. These, these churches were in Asia Minor, which today is uh, Turkey, the nation of Turkey. Um, these churches were of various sizes, of various ages, but the Lord in particular wanted John to to write these letters to these churches to address concerns that were present then, but more importantly for us, concerns regarding Christians of today, things that we must be mindful of. Last week, we concluded our study on the third church, the church at Pergamum. And as you can recall, those of you that have been following along with us, Pergamum was a church that was compromised. It was compromised. The people who were in that congregation, now, mind you, not everyone in the church had compromised, but Jesus was concerned about the model of church, a church where the model that was present was one of compromise. Everybody in the church was not compromised, but the overall model of that church was one that was compromised. As you can recall, this was a church that was in an area 
that was surrounded by many influences, many influences. It was surrounded by many religions. It was surrounded by many beliefs. And it was a church that felt as a whole, in order to get along, they needed to go along. In order to fit in with their surrounding environment, they needed to accept many of the principles and teachings that were going on around them. And so Jesus' message to the church at Pergamum is that to compromise uh, is to conform. And when the church is no longer distinct, when Christians no longer have a light that shines, when Christians no longer are the salt of the earth, they are no longer representing Christ to the world. The reason why the church is is the church is a beacon, a beacon of hope, a beacon of truth, a beacon of, beacon of light. And when believers, when a church is no longer that beacon, it is no longer fulfilling its purpose and mission. And so what we closed on last week was the importance of learning from Pergamum these points. Do not tolerate in your midst compromise. Compromise causes people to stumble. We must not allow ourselves to become conformed to the world, but rather we must be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Christians must stand for the truth, as we shared with you last week. Though we remain in the world, we must not become of the world. Spiritual compromise leads to spiritual corruption. And so we left last week with these, with these expressions. When we take the Lord's Supper, there is a scripture that we read in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, beginning at verse number 23, where we read through taking the Lord's Supper. One of the things that Jesus speaks to us through his word in 1 Corinthians 11 is that let a man examine himself. Let a person examine themselves. And so let them eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he who eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation unto the Lord, not discerning the Lord's body. What does that mean to examine yourself? You are the best judge of whether or not you are pure in heart. You are the best judge of whether or not you have compromised. You are the best judge of whether or not you are going along to get along. You are the best judge of whether or not your light has grown dim because you want to fit in. There is danger in compromise. When you allow yourself to compromise your beliefs, your position, your walk, it leads to corruption. I'm going to give you one final scripture and then we're going to begin our lesson tonight. I want you to go to John chapter number 15. John chapter number 15. St. John chapter number 15. And we're going to go down to verses uh, 18 and 19. St. John chapter number 15, verse 18 and 19. Would you turn with me now, please, to St. John chapter 15, verse 18 and 19. This is our final scripture regarding compromise, as was the case at Pergamum. Chapter number 15, St. John, verse 18 and 19, and it reads, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love its own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Simply put, Jesus is saying to the believer, expect not to be liked. If you are truly walking in truth, if you are truly walking in light, we need to anticipate that the world will not like what we stand for. They did not like Jesus. They do not like the world wants to remain in sin. 
people who do not believe nor have faith in the Lord want to remain in the dark. And so when we see ourselves as needing to be validated by the customs and traditions that surround us by the actions of others, then we are conforming to the world. Jesus says to the church, he says to us, the world hates you. If the world hates you, know that they hated me before they hated you. And so my brothers and sisters, let me just say it as clearly as it needs to be said. When you are truly walking in the light, darkness will not embrace you. When you are clearly walking and embracing the truth, those who profess lies and live a lifestyle contrary to the truth will not embrace you. If we are to be like Christ, we must recognize that as they treated Christ, the world, so will they treat us. We aren't in this to be the most popular. We are in this to save souls. We are not in this to be the largest and the grandest. We are in this to please the Lord. And so my friends, it is clear that when compromise is the view, then corruption is not far behind. This is the lesson of Pergamum. Now the fourth church that Jesus told John to write to was the church at Thyatira. Thyatira. Now this church happens to be the smallest church of all the seven, but interestingly enough, it's the longest letter of all the seven. It's smallest in size, but Jesus chooses to say the most to this particular church. Now, why might that be the case? I can only speculate, but I can tell you this. The focus of the church, of the message to the church at Thyatira was that it was a church that had become contaminated from within. It had become contaminated within. Let me say this as we get into this lesson tonight. The challenge for Pergamum was how to remain pure in a dark environment, in a environment that was hostile. The challenge for Pergamum was how do you remain pure in a hostile environment as a Christian? And don't allow yourself to compromise in order to get along when you are in a environment that is hostile. The challenge for the Thyatira was a challenge from within. When there is doctrine and teaching within the body, then the destruction is so much greater. Pergamum was fighting a battle from the outside in. Thyatira was fighting a battle from the inside out. Jesus once said, it's not what comes into the body that destroys you, but what comes out of the body that destroys you. Thyatira was a contaminated church, a contaminated church. Pergamum was a compromising church. Thyatira is a contaminated church. This is the longest letter of the seven. I've already mentioned that to you, and it's addressed to the smallest city. Thyatira was a wealthy town, though it was a small community. It was on the Lycus River in, the Roman prov in a Roman province of Asia, Asia Minor, which is current day Turkey, all of these cities and churches were in an area that now Turkey is located. 
This particular city was about 35 miles from Pergamum, the church that we just talked about. Now, in this particular city, interestingly enough, uh, most of it was a company town. It was a it was a town that was built on commerce. Most of the income that was available came from employment in various trades and labor guilds. Today we call labor groups labor unions. In those days they referred to them as labor guilds. What was different about the labor guilds of the Old Testament and New Testament time was that it didn't just uh, involve activities on the job. The guild was uh, like a group of people that not only shared activities while on the job, but the guild also dictated where you worshiped, who you worshiped, where you fellowshiped, and who you fellowshiped with. It truly was something that was more of a lifestyle commitment. When you were a part of a guild, it was almost like a gang. It's like a syndicate. You couldn't just simply go from one guild to another or from one group to another. You were locked in. This was how the labor was performed in Thyatira. And it dictated not only what you did, but also where you worshiped these labor guilds. So in order to remain in good standing, Christians at Thyatira, they were not only required to perform their work, but it was also necessary to offer tribute to various gods, various deities, like Apollos, for example. This was to include offering sacrifices to these gods. If you didn't conform to that, if you didn't indulge in that, you were likely to be kicked out of the guild and therefore also lose your career, lose your source of income. So Christians in Thyatira were truly confronted with very difficult decisions. Either I adhere to my Christian beliefs and follow my God, or I will have to stray from that in order to stay in my guild and keep my career because there were times of the years when they had festivals and they would do sacrifices to various gods. And if you were a Christian, you had to make a decision. Am I going to sacrifice to these gods or am I going to stand on the word of God. This was the environment that existed in Thyatira when John wrote this letter. Now, coincidentally, Thyatira was a commercial town, as I mentioned. It was a company town. Most of the income was made in manufacturing or various kinds of trades. Coincidentally, the Apostle Paul when he came on his first missionary journey, he encountered a woman who was a resident of Thyatira. She was a very wealthy woman who was in the trade of manufacturing cloth. This woman manufactured purple cloth. And purple was a royal color. Everybody couldn't buy purple. And so as a result, and it wasn't easy to make. So as a result of being in this trade, this particular woman was a wealthy woman. And she was the first person that Paul is recorded to have converted when he came into Europe. She is the one, it is believed, who brought the word back to Thyatira and began the first church in Thyatira. Let's look at this as we open up this lesson. Go with me to Acts chapter number 16, verse 13 through 15. Let's go to Acts chapter number 16. This is Paul's first missionary journey. 
And on his first missionary journey, he encountered a woman. And he converted this woman. She was a wealthy woman. She became what we believe to be uh, the one who organized the first church in, Th in Europe, Thyatira. Let's go to Acts chapter number 16, verse 13 through 15. Are we there? All righty, we're starting our lesson off. All righty, verse number, verse number uh, 13. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was accustomed to be made. And we sat down and spoke unto the woman who resorted there. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, who worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken by Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. This, my friends, just by way of history, is the first person who was converted in Europe when Paul made his, first missionary, his missionary journey. She is the first person recorded to have accepted Christ. She was from Thyatira. Her name was Lydia. She was a marketer of purple. She was wealthy enough to have her own house. And it is believed that it is in her house that the church of Thyatira was started in her house. And this is where it all began in Europe. So Thyatira was a place that had some significance now let's talk a little bit more about this letter. Go back with me to Revelations chapter number 2, if you would, verses 18 through 29. Let me share with you the Lord's words to this church as we get into this lesson. The fourth church, Thyatira. Revelations chapter number 2, verse 18 through 29. As I said, this is the longest letter written to the smallest church verse number 18 and it reads and unto the angel of the church of Thyatira write these things saith the, the son of God who hath his eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like fine brass I know thy works and love and service and faith and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou allow that woman Jezebel, who calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto, unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts and will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and who have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you no other burden, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. 
even as I received of my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now let's unpack this. This is the contaminated church, the contaminated believer, the contaminated people. As we look at this particular text and we open it up as Jesus opens it up for them, Jesus affirms the church's positive actions. Listen, this was a church that was doing a lot of positive things, much like Pergamum. It was a church, in fact, that Jesus had several positive statements to make. Look at verse number 19. He says, I know thy works, thy love and service and faith and patience. I know thy works and the last to be more than the first. As Jesus spoke to the people at Thyatira, he was saying in some ways, this church is a model church. This is a model church. They had love. They had love both for the Lord and for one another. In many respects, they were a model church. They had service. They did ministry. They had faith. They had patience to endure. Not only that, but look at what Jesus says. Jesus says not only that did they have works, but they had an increasing measure of work. Look at what Jesus says at the conclusion of verse number 19, where he says, the last is more than the first. In other words, this particular people, this particular congregation, these were people that were rising in their faith, rising in their love, increasing in their patience, increasing in their service. They had overcome the challenges from without. Pergamum as we talked about it earlier, was overcome by external conditions. Not so with Thyatira. This was a church that had overcome external pressures. Even though the people of this church were in these labor guilds and it was required of them that they must make certain uh, accommodations to work, these were, this was a church that was determined to buttress itself against all external forces, all external distractions, all external pressures. It was a church that was demonstrating love in the community. It was a church that was demonstrating service in the community. It was a church that was walking in faith. It was a church that was patiently enduring. It was a church whose work was growing. Jesus commends this church for its latter day is greater than its former. What better thing could the Lord say about any one of us than that we are growing in love, growing in patience, growing in faith, growing in service. This was the word that Jesus gave to this church. They had overcome external challenges. Now, my friends, it's important for us to recognize that if we're going to be able to do as the Lord would command us to do, we have to be able to overcome external pressures. That was the challenge that Pergamum could not handle. They compromised. They conformed. So Jesus, in talking to Thyatira, says, you are not like that. You are a people that is standing against the obstacles that are outside, that are attacking you, and you are growing. Nevertheless, despite all the good Jesus saw in the church at Thyatira, despite all the good that Jesus sees in those who are standing against external attack, there was still a problem. And this problem was even more insidious than the problem that was facing Pergamum from the outside. The difference between Pergamus and Thyatira is that in Pergamus, Satan uses the outside pressures of the world to lead the church to compromise its identity. 
But in Thyatira, Satan is able to do even greater damage from inside attacks, from a poison that is within, not from without. Satan uses a different technique with Thyatira. He recognizes that this is a people that is constantly observant against external attack and they are standing strong. But inside, there is a vicious, pernicious poison that has begun to fester. Let's look at a scripture as we move forward. I want you to go with me to Matthew chapter 24, and we're going to look at verses 10 through 14. Matthew chapter 24, verses 10 through 14. All right, Matthew 24, verse number 10. And it reads as follows. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall, uh, shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall grow cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Jesus is saying here in the 24th chapter, verses 10 through 14, that many shall be offended, many shall, be, shall betray one another. There's going to be a rising up of false prophets. There's going to be a challenge from within. And because of the challenge from within, there shall be iniquity and it shall abound and the love of many shall grow cold because of the challenge from within. You see, when Satan was successful with Pergamum in attacking from the outside, there are certain Christians who feel the need to be accepted by the world, to fit in. And so they compromise their faith. Others, however, are determined to not compromise because they don't seek exception from the outside. But yet they are vulnerable from the inside to false doctrine, false teaching. Let's look at what Jesus has to say. Go back with me to Revelation chapter number 2, verse number 20. Jesus says, in spite of the fact that you are showing faith, in spite, of, in spite of the fact that your service is growing, in spite of the fact that you have demonstrated that you are able to have patience, he says, nevertheless, despite all that, I have an issue. Let's look at Revelation chapter 20 and verse 2. Let's see what Jesus, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 20 Chapter 2, verse 20, what does Jesus say? Jesus says, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Verse 20. Jesus says, notwithstanding the things that you are standing against from external, I have an issue with you because you have allowed a false prophet, a prophetess, this woman Jezebel, a woman who calls herself a prophet, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. A false prophetess was leading believers in the church of Thyatira to follow false doctrine. 
The church was engaging in sexual immorality and idolatry. Rather than rebuke this false teacher and send her out of the church, the believers in Thyatira were allowing her to continue her deception. And as a result, they were seduced into practices of the world. Now, my friends, Jesus speaks very harshly against those who are within the body of Christ, those who are in the church, who seek to contaminate the church with false doctrine. He speaks harshly to those who are easily seduced by false doctrine simply because it is appealing to your senses. It is appealing to your desires. The scripture teaches us that in these last days that people will listen to those things which are appealing to their ears. This is why we have so many cult leaders, so many false teachers who are able to dissuade and to lead the people of faith down paths because they are appealing to your senses. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter number 12. Deuteronomy chapter number 12, verse 28 through 32. Turn with me, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 28 through 32. Let's see what the Lord, what the word of God reveals to us here. Deuteronomy 12, verse 28 through 32. All right, let's go there together. All right. Chapter 12, verse 28. And it reads, Observe and hear all these words which I command thee, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee forever. When thou doest that which is good and right in the sight of the Lord thy God, when the Lord thy God shall cut off the nations from before thee, where thou goest to possess them, and thou succeedest them, and dwellest in their land, take heed of thyself. Take heed of thyself, that thou be not snared by following them, after they are destroyed from before thee, and that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. Verse number 31. Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God, for every abomination to the Lord, which he hateth, hath they done unto their gods. For even their sons and their daughters they have burned in the fire to their gods. Whatsoever thing I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. Now, my friends, as we get into this further, the Lord God gave a command to Israel that said, when you get into the new land that I'm going to take you, there will be influences there. Don't allow that doctrine to become your doctrine. Don't allow that teaching to become your teaching. Don't allow those, no matter how persuasive their arguments may be, to take you off of what you know I've given to you. In our day and age today, so many believers are so easily influenced because they don't spend enough time in the word of God themselves. It's good for us to be able to communicate as we do through Facebook Live and through um, conference lines and through various videos and through YouTube. All of that's good. But my friends, let me say something to you. 
you've got to study the word yourself. You've got to open your Bible yourself. You've got, as the Bible says, to do this, study to show yourself approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed. It isn't possible for you to be strong and to be steady and to hold your course when you are being spoon-fed from somebody else's mouth all the time. You know, when you're a baby, it's all right for your parents to take your food, to chew it up and put it in your mouth, and then you, 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 can't, you don't know how to chew yourself. You can't, you can't digest it yet. But you cannot be a baby spiritually all the time. There has to come a time when you study yourself, when you open the word of God yourself. This is why the Lord God was telling Israel that when you get into the promised land, there's going to be people around you who are going to be talking about their God, talking about their religion, talking about their faith, talking about this. Don't allow yourself to take that doctrine in. Stay with what you know. Stay the course. People in the world today need to know. People in the church today need to know that God's word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's no new gospel. We have to stay with what God has given to us. Let's go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter. 2 Peter. I'd like for you to go to the second chapter of 2 Peter, verse 1 through 6. Turn with me, if you would, to 2 Peter, verse 1 through 6. All right. 2 Peter, chapter number 2. Verse 1 through 6. Let me read this for you. But there are false prophets. Do you see that? Second Peter chapter number 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who secretly shall bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord that, brought, that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they, with feign words, make merchandise of you, whose judgment now for a long time lingereth not, and their destruction slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overflow making them an example unto those uh, that after should live ungodly. And then he goes on, Peter, to talk about how Lot was one of the few, that was the one that was de delivered. But the point that Peter is raising here is that we need to be mindful that there are false teachers and false doctrine. And if God didn't spare the angels who went through uh, and followed the teaching of Lucifer and were cast out of heaven, if he didn't spare, spare Sodom and Gomorrah, if he destroyed the earth and only found Noah and his sons and his, their, their wives to be worthy of being saved, what do you expect to be the result of false teaching in the church today? Let's go down to verse 19 in 1 Peter chapter, uh, sec, first, second Peter chapter number 2. Let's go down to verse 19 through 22 as I finish that thought. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse number 19. While they promise them liberty, these false teachers, false prophets, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. 
For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in it and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Verse 22. But it is happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in mire. What is Peter saying? Peter is saying that so often when you become contaminated because you are following false teaching and false doctrine, it is as if you are going back to the old vomit that you had escaped from and you're eating it again. It's as if you've been washed as a sow or as a pig and you're going back to that same old muddy pool that you came out of. What has happened? How is it that you've allowed yourself to go back into that bondage? This is the reason that Jesus told John to write to Thyatira. It's because even though they were standing as a church community against the adversaries, they could see outside the attack from the enemy from the outside. They were allowing false teaching and false doctrine to contaminate them from the inside. It is not clear. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 2, looking at Thyatira. Jesus, in verse number 20, speaks specifically against a prophetess by the name of Jezebel. Do you see that in verse number 20 of Revelation chapter 2? Jesus specifically calls out a prophetess whose name was Jezebel. It is not clear to us today as we read this letter. It's not clear if that's her real name or not. Because Jezebel also has significance in the Old Testament. It's not clear if her real name was Jezebel or if it was the Lord's intention to use the name metaphorically in reference to the Jezebel of the Old Testament. When you say Jezebel, when you say Jezebel, you immediately know what type of personality and character it represents. This was an idolatrous woman who opposed God's ways. Jezebel is synonymous to us now as evil. She was the epitome of a wicked person who was totally consumed by themselves and a need for power. She was infamous in that uh, she was influential in manipulating her husband, King Ahab, to lead the people of Israel towards the worship of a false god, Baal. So infamous is her name that to this day, no one names their daughter Jezebel. And to call a woman a Jezebel is one of the greatest insults imaginable. So it's not clear to us today if this prophetess, if her name was actually Jezebel, or whether the Lord was using this as a label to identify the character of this person and what they really represented. Now, we do know it was a woman. We do know that this person claimed to be a prophetess. But in looking at the story of Jezebel, it is clear that the Lord had the intent of speaking harshly about the character of the person who was claiming to speak in his behalf. 
Be mindful, my friends. To speak in the behalf of God is no idle thing. To say, thus saith the Lord, and to speak in behalf of God is something to be done with reverence. It is something to be done only when you have been directed by God to speak in his behalf. So many people today stand behind a podium and speak as if they are speaking for God, when in reality, they are speaking for themselves. People today stand behind pulpits, write letters, write books, as if they are spokespersons for God, when in reality, they are seeking their own profit and gain. As God, as the Lord spoke so harshly of Jezebel, uh, this particular prophetess, it is clear that the Lord has much to say to those who would claim to speak for him when in fact they are actually speaking for their own gain. Just because someone claims to be a self-appointed prophet of God or has an eloquent message does not mean that Christians need to listen to them. As a Christian, we need to judge the Spirit by the Spirit to see if it is the Spirit of God at work. Let's go to 1 John. Let's go to 1 John chapter number 4. 1 John chapter number 4 and verse number 1. 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 1. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 1. And it reads, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try or test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. John declares in this letter that as a believer, we have to be mindful that we should not simply follow every doctrine, every sermon, every word, unless it is coming from God. Let me tell you, my friends, there's some eloquent people out there. There's some people who can read, uh, recite scripture who don't know Jesus. There are people who are trying to influence believers to lead us astray who don't know the Lord. We have to be mindful, just as the scripture says, to not believe every spirit, but try the spirit, test the spirits, whether they are of God. Because there are many false prophets. How do you know if it's of God? Well, first of all, if it is not in conformance with the word of God, even if it is a persuasive statement, then it's not of God. If it does not exalt the Lord and Savior, it is not of God. If it does not speak life and hope, and faith, it is not of God. You see, it must exalt God. It must edify Christ. It must speak of life and hope of, and faith. This is how we know it's of God. If it is contrary to the word of God, it is not of God. No matter how eloquent it may sound, no matter how persuasive it, it might be, let me give you a few final scriptures and then we'll close for tonight. The Lord in Revelation chapter 2 as he's speaking to Thyatira says, this is a false prophet. A false prophetess, this Jezebel. That may have been her name or it may have been a description of her character. But false prophets are to be we are to be mindful that we are to not follow 
those who speak false word. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter number 14. Jeremiah chapter number 14. Jeremiah 14, verse 13 through 16. Jeremiah 14, verse number 13 through 16. And it reads from the King James Version. Then said I, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, Ye shall not see the sword, neither shall ye have famine. But I will give you assured peace in this place. Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spoke unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their hearts. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, and I sent them not. Yet they say, sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. And the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword, and they shall have none to bury them. Them, their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour their wickedness upon them. The false prophet will be consumed by the very thing that they prophesied would not happen. The Lord said, that is your just punishment because you spoke lies in my name. And those who followed you will also fall, fall victim to the lies that you prophesied to them. Let me give you one more scripture, Ezekiel chapter number 13. Go with me to Ezekiel chapter 13. Verse 1 through 9, and then we'll close. Ezekiel chapter 13. Verse 1 through 9. Ezekiel. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy. And say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God. Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit. And have seen nothing. O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the desert. Yea, ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. They have seen vanity and lying divinations, saying, The Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them, and they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Have ye not seen a vain vision? And have ye not spoken a lying divination, whereas ye say the Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because ye have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. And my hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies, they shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written in the writings of the house of Israel, neither shall they enter into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord God. So my friends, I want to just close tonight's lesson by simply saying, 
in spite of Thyatira's success in fighting off external challenges, in spite of Thyatira's ability to stand against external attack, they had allowed false teaching, false doctrine, false prophecy to contaminate them from within. And they were embracing these false teachings simply because it suited them and their needs. The greatest challenge to the people of God today is not what we are receiving from the outside, but what we are eating, what we are receiving inside. We must get the word in our heart. We must read the word for ourselves. We must not simply rely on the media, social media, and other types of media to feed us without seeing what the word actually says. It's too tempting. And this is what leads many people to become weak is because we do not know the word ourselves. We're going to close right now with that. We're going to open up the lines very briefly to see if there's any comments or if there's any questions on what we've covered tonight. Um, and uh, then we will close with prayer on tonight. At this time, if we have any questions or any comments, the line is open for our conference line. Anyone have any questions or comments? All right. Okay, we don't have any questions or comments tonight, and so we're going to close out with prayer. Uh, I thank God for all of you who have joined us on this evening as we go forward in uh, our study. We're going to continue next week uh, with this study, and uh, I'd like for you just to uh, look closely at the remaining verses uh, that Jesus spoke in this particular section to Thyatira. Uh, we're going to close it next week. Uh, we're going to close out with prayer. We're asking that you continue to pray uh, for uh, our nation, pray for uh, our friends in, in India. I saw Pastor Prakash was on earlier. Let us continue to pray for the pandemic. Let us continue to pray for those who are facing, um, uh, who are in bereavement at this present time. Uh, we're praying for those who were hospitalized. I received word a few days ago uh, regarding uh, an old acquaintance that was a member of Paradise years ago. Her family grew up uh, with us there, uh, Brenda Hamilton Nash, or Brenda Nash Hamilton. We're asking for prayer for her. Uh, she's been recently hospitalized. Let's continue to keep one another in prayer uh, as we close out on this evening. Let's pray. For Lord God, as we close on tonight, we're asking you, Lord, for mercy and for grace as we, as we go forward, Lord. There's so many things that we see that are not true. And Lord, we need to be able to know the truth, for the truth is what will make us free. We pray tonight, Lord, that as we close this lesson, that we will not be victims of an internal poison, beliefs and doctrines that are not of you but we pray lord god that we would know the truth and that we would follow the truth and that we would study the truth we pray lord god that you continue to bless the kingdom and all who are serving you we pray for the sick and the shut and the bereaved and we ask you god that as we go forward that we would be strengthened uh, and encouraged day by day to lift you up to share the good news that others will come to know you and be saved. For ultimately, Lord, this is our purpose, is to go forward and share the good news so that men and women can be saved. Bless us and keep us, for you are the only one, God, who can truly give us more than we can ask or even imagine. And we thank you. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. 
Now may God's grace and his communion and his spirit be with you. May he continue to lift you and give you peace until we get together again in Jesus' name. Thank you for joining us, and we'll look forward to seeing you, God willing, next Wednesday uh, as we continue this study in the seven churches of Revelation. Good evening. God bless you. Amen.